This week's episode of Talking to Mod is sponsored by the Coffee Mod. Don't just dress like an ace face, drink like one too. They're also giving our listeners 15% off when you use the promo code MAGICMOD15. So what are you waiting for? How are we doing everyone and welcome to episode 23 of Talking to Mod. This week we have frontman from the Seahorses and all round top guy Chris Helm. I met Chris three or four weeks ago at a show we both did in Northwich and we got on like a house on fire. So it was only right that I get him on the podcast and we can chat more. So ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax and enjoy episode 23 of Talking to Mod. Oh, here he is. Hello. There we go. We got there in the end, mate. What the fuck? Oh, fuck. Are you in China? Oh, it sounds like it. Oh, my God. There he is, the main man. Pad doesn't... uh, I don't usually use this, so I don't even know where the camera is. Oh, there we are. You're looking good, man. You're looking good. Uh, I won't go that far. I'm being polite. I'm the one with the specs. I, I think I need bins, mate. I'm telling you, like, lately I've been probably squinting at everything and, like, even trying to read a book. I'm like, shit, I might have to accept that. I might have to put it's a pair of specs it. on. I know, man. Do about it. <laughs> How are you, though, mate? You all good? I'm all right, yeah. I'm good. Just been uh, arguing with my uh, computer. Um, I, as you can tell, modern technology is not my forte. So, uh, <laughs> honestly, I'm like swearing calling an inanimate object the c word over and over again it's just not good <laughs> it don't make it work any quicker it just makes me angry and angrier and angrier so there we are but, but anyway, never mind. that weren't yeah. because of this though that weren't no, trying to set it up for this no was no, it? no it wasn't this was to do with my album i've just been trying to send some files to some people <sighs> and how's that coming on it's all good it's all mustard um sounds good um yeah yeah I'm I'm really happy with it actually. It's um it's taken ages to do, but uh, it was worth the wait. I think, and it was. I'm glad that I had a chance to deliberate and fuck around with it. So yeah, pretty good really. How long have you been working on this one? I'm not telling you. It's embarrassing. <laughs> oh, no, all right, all right. So, <laughs> listen, mate. There's some tricks I've been working on right for absolute years, right? And that's the truth, gospel, right? And uh, they last about a minute, a minute and a half, honestly. Right. So don't right, feel right. embarrassed about that, okay. honestly. Well, Some of them take me years. Okay, well, I'll tell you. So I think The Rookery was my last album, and that came out in 2012. So this was taking 11 years, and it was bogged down by all sorts of things. Um, I should have known from the beginning, really, because when we went to the Lake District to record it, three cars broke down, so everyone was late. People got lost. People were arriving at like half past three in the morning. We were trying to find them. Stuart Fletcher, the bass player, was there with his Google Maps on his phone, but he'd kind of taken a screenshot. And so I was wondering why he wasn't moving when he'd, we'd ended up walking around the corner for about five miles. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was a bit of a strange one, but um, I'm glad it's done now. Uh, it's one of those things. Where I think I abandoned it about four or five times this morning, but I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to stuck with it. Um, yeah, so yeah, it sounds really good. I'm very, very happy good. with it. Good, and I'm looking forward to hearing it, mate, as I'm, I'm sure that many others are too. So, well, when it gets a bit nearer to, to the release date, I'll send you a link to it, um, and you can let me know what you think. Oh, please do, mate, honestly. But listen, I'm only a magician, all right? <laughs> My opinion don't matter. You're not a magician, you're a mod, so it means that you know about music. I'll have it some goes, of that, it goes, yeah. It goes with the territory, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does, man, it certainly does. What I want to know, though, is how did you get involved in music in the first place? Let's go back when you were a young little nipper, mate. Um, what got you? I always liked music. I think it was um, lots of things. My... my um. 
I just had no interest in anything at all at primary school, like as far as academic stuff. And I was quite sporty, but as long as I wasn't doing it with anyone else, so if I was doing athletics and things, I really liked that. I didn't really like the idea of a lot of wannabe alpha males shouting at each other on a football pitch, you know, when we, and it just sort of made me think, well, this is fucking pointless. What a bunch of knuckle draggers. I don't really want to eat. So I've always wanted to do things a little bit more sort of self-centric, really. Um, so I ended up kind of, I remember just listening to music, uh, classical music even. Um, and it was quite a musical school. You're always singing like Beatles songs and stuff and ABBA songs and all sorts of things in assembly, um, along with all the religious nonsense. Um, and then as time went on, I realized that everyone else's parents had more records than my mum and dad. Uh, my mum had literally three albums and one was the best of Jose Feliciano, which introduced me weirdly later on in life to the Doors because I was like, he did loads of Doors covers. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Light Me Fire and all that. And then he did a, he did a lot of Beatles stuff. Uh, my mum was a massive fan of the Beatles, but didn't have any of the records, which I couldn't figure out. Uh, and she had the best of Shirley Bassey and the best of Tom Jones. So oh, wow. And I don't know where this Welsh thing came from. Uh, <laughs> but it was like... You know, listening to this really quite... I don't know if you, as a kid, listening to Tom Jones and Shirley Bassey, and she used to play it a lot. Um, and she, she was singing, Something in the way she moves, by George Harrison. And I, I fell asleep, and I had a nightmare to this haunting, horrible banshee of a woman singing this, murdering this Beatles song. Um, so every time I even hear the George Harrison version, now it's just... I get the heebie-jeebies about it. But um, yeah, so I got into music like that. My mate used to play piano, but we couldn't afford a piano lessons. So I always was frustrated that I couldn't play music, even though I really wanted to. Must have been the weirdest kid that was begging for piano lessons while everyone else was wanting to be out playing football with the knuckle draggers. <laughs> so uh, I started playing guitar when I was 19. Um, I started singing when I was uh, probably a bit, probably 20. Um, my uh, girlfriend at the time lived in a shared house in York. She was a student, and um, everyone in the house was just proper potheads doing like hot knives every night and stuff. And one of the lads was a bass player called Andy Parrish, and he um, he heard me singing in the bath, and uh, I think he'd just been kicked out of a band that he was in, and he asked me to join his band. And I thought he was in a band, but he wanted a band. <laughs> He'd just been bit without out of one. So I, ju I joined his band. And then um, uh, that was it. We sort of made it up as we went along, really. Um, he taught me a few tricks on guitar. Taught me a few tricks about songwriting. Um, we listened to a lot of crazy music. Um, and I was, I guess, after that, when you start hanging around with your mates like that, and you go around to people's houses and listen to records. I remember buying the, the Lars album and went around to my mate Nick Walker's house and we were just trying to learn the songs you know and he was a really good guitarist and I remember just learning things from my mates who were just really patient um, but I always thought everyone could sing I didn't know that it was a bit of a thing so I was more interested in playing guitar but um, as it turns out it went the other way really. But there we are. Talking about the Lars how how cool was it the other day when me and you were sitting backstage oh, yeah, with watching John, John Powell? And how incredible was he, though? He's got a lot of energy, he? and he was uh, he was fantastic, and it was really nice to hear the, the new songs from the, the new cast album. Mm. Um, yeah, I like John. He's, he's, a, he's a really nice guy. Um, and he works hard at it, and he's pretty consistent. I get quite nervous in between songs, and I talk a lot of crap, uh, but he just... I think he's got enough songs in his back catalogue to just bang them out. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've had one album with the Seahorses is pretty much that everybody knows. But um, other than that, I've got a lot of solo stuff. And uh, this band, there's music with, from the Yards that I was in a band called the Yards for seven years. And um, but no one's really familiar with that sort of music. So, uh, but John can just draw from however many decades he's been doing the music and and. Uh, and you know every one of them, it's great. Oh, classic. Timeless. You Going back to what you just said a minute ago, getting nervous in between songs, so you um, you just talk shit, basically, right? I thought you were fucking hilarious, mate. 
<laughs> and I'm not just saying that because you're here. I honestly thought this is different, right? There's a bit of like, there's it, songs and then there's a bit of comedy. I'm like, I'm having a bit of this, mate. Oh, honestly. really? Uh, well, it's, maybe it's maybe supposed, you don't try to be, it's but supposed I, it was to be comedy. It was hilarious, man. I think, I think the thing is, is that because I've been doing the, I did the 25th anniversary of Do It Yourself and I wasn't planning on doing it. Um, and I've got quite a lot of stories about the songs themselves. Because it was a mad time for me when I was recording that back then. Um, and it was kind of these stories of going to, you know, John Squire's house and kind of being too scared to go for a crap because I was in his house. <laughs> I didn't want to make the house stink. So, Serious? Yes, yeah, so I went upstairs and sat, finally had to give in and I went to the loo and he had a bunch of um, 40 and Times magazines, which were like the conspiracy theorist magazines. Um, and I realised he'd been pilfering some of the lyrics from his new for his new songs from it, and you know, and I just start talking about these things that that happened, and I remember it, it resonates in my in my mind. But it's like being sat around a table in a pub where someone's asking you a story, and you got you know it's your turn to to have a bit of a banter, but they're not supposed to be jokes. <laughs> and that maybe maybe I said it the wrong way. I didn't mean it as in like jokes. Well, the thing but I just is, mean I they're very you, funny stories. Yeah, if you set your style as a comedian then you know, people you know do they expect to be laughing their heads off so if i waffle on then it's a maybe it's a bonus maybe people just want me to crack on with it <laughs> but i talk because it makes me feel a bit more um relaxed i guess good yeah. yeah i love that and i think a lot of people enjoy it because you're connecting with them as well as well as singing your songs you're chilling out and you're having as you said like a chat as yeah. if you're down the pub yeah well, there's a few things it's like I, i'm not I don't enjoy what I'm doing when I'm nervous and I'm quite nervous before I go on because you never know what it's going to be. Um, but I think it was something that maybe goes back to the sea horses where it was like, you know, I could stand out busking on the streets of York all day and it won't bother me at all, you know, and you probably have maybe, I don't know, thousands of people walk past you. Um, but when you're playing Glastonbury and there's thousands of people staring at you, <laughs> that was a massively different experience. And, uh, and I had to come up with a way of battling that. Um, and I think when I started to do the acoustic stuff, um, I used to pretend I was just in my living room at home and everyone that was in front of me was invited to my house. And if I didn't like them, I could send them fuck off. So, <laughs> <laughs> which seems to work wonders. Um, so I didn't mind that at all. It was, and then the, and the more relaxed I get, the more sort of chatty. I mean, short of getting up and making myself a cup of tea in mid set, I, I, you know, what? I haven't done that yet, but I might do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> mental. Yeah, yeah. That's mad. <laughs> man. But there's there's all different ways of settling nerves. I mean, before before when I was nervous and doing stage stuff, I used to drink a hell of a lot, mate, just to try and overcome the fear of the nerves. But since like stopping all that and being you know in the sobriety and that, not to talk, you know mention about it all the time, but it's it's a different ball game where I sort of use the nerves to my advantage now. So yeah, yeah. whereas before I thought I was petrified of it, thinking, oh, shit, what if this goes wrong? What if this? But now I channel it into like a positive energy, and as soon as I step out there, no matter if there's ten people, twenty people, thousand, two thousand, whatever, it, it's always going to be the same outcome. And also, a lot of people always say to me, why do you wear glasses on the stage? And the reason that is, is it's like a mask. It's so stupid, <laughs> but it is like, I, I feel a I bit totally safe with them on. Do yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? I used to sing with my eyes shut. And it was like, you know, I just used to think, if I have my eyes shut, I can't see them. They can't see me, which is very stupid. <laughs> they had a dog that used to do that. He's, he's a big Alsatian. He used to hide, it, hide its head behind the city and his ass would be sticking out and you'd think you couldn't see him. And it's a bit of a similar thing. But... um. I'm kind of, I know what you mean about the drinking and stuff. I used to do that as well, but you learn the hard way with that. Um, and it doesn't really ever make you think. It, you can probably convince yourself that you're doing all right, but I, I know that I'm definitely not at my best when I've, when I've had far too much to drink. Yeah. I can have a little, but not too much. Um, no. no it's, yeah. Yeah. It either goes one way or the other, doesn't it? I remember doing a show, I think it was the Water Rats in London, and I, somehow I thought it'd be good to have a couple of light ales before at like three o'clock in the afternoon when I weren't doing the gig until about eight. Yeah. 
somehow two ends up being four and so on and so on. And then you're on the stage and you're off cut and you've been doing all sorts of yeah. things and you think, this probably weren't a good fucking idea. This, you know what yeah. I mean? The, yeah. cl- the cards are going all on the floor. Well, the thing was, is before people were filming it on the phones, you know, you just have a memory of someone being a pissed up dickhead, embarrassing himself on stage, rather than uh, everyone's got it filled now. So, you know, some right horrific stuff online from, from my earlier performances. Where, but, you know, it's all part of the, uh, the tapestry, in it? And what can you, you know, you just learn from it and move on. A hundred percent, man, a hundred percent. What would you say your first album was that you ever bought? Oh, no, it was, it was um, the first album. Well, if I'm going to be massively honest with you, my dad bought me it, and I was literally like four. Go on. It was Rupert Bear and the Firebird. <laughs> and I didn't listen to it for years, and then one night I got a bit baked and listened to it, and it's trippy as fuck. It's really good. <laughs> it must have been recorded by some massive stoners in the 70s. Um, so that was my first album that my dad bought me. And you could colour it in on the back. It was great. And then I remember going up town with a lad called Jason Hicks when I was nine. And um, I went to buy... Um, what was it? It was Snap, I think. Whenever that came out. You know, the compilation by The Jam. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was it? Cool the first single I ever bought was um, I Want Candy by Bow Wow Wow. And then very swiftly followed by... <laughs> Um, <laughs> he was very swiftly, but well, because he was naked on the front cover, I was like, Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was, um, what was the single that the jam had out that was it start and it had Liza, Liza, Liza Radley as the B side? Liza, Liza Radley, Radley, yeah, yeah, Radley, see the girl with long hair. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, mate, you got to chuck that in a set. <laughs> I'll have to learn the words properly. All right, you um, play it, I'll sing it. It's a bit of a different setting from You Do Something To Me. Oh, 100%. Before it was like, oi, oi. Did, what, what, <laughs> did you see they had a documentary the other day? I missed it. It was all about uh, Wild Wood, apparently, the, yeah, the, the yeah. album. I, I missed it, but I, I've got to I, get I'm that back. I think you have to probably be on iPlayer or something, whatever it's mm. on. I'm going to watch that because I always hanker back to that album. Um, it's really timeless that album it's fantastic um, I've been thinking a lot about Paul Weller recently actually because uh, I was in Brighton maybe two or three weeks ago and that's where I, I wrote Blinded by the Sun but I was listening this was like 1995 as well so I was listening to a lot of Paul Weller like Black, um, Wildwood and Stanley Rose I think might have just come out and then there was um, a lot of Verve stuff and Oasis, obviously, and mm. their B sides, Oasis B sides, and all of that just kind of formed together for me to sort of that. Because I think my sister was a mod, so she was into sort of um, the Small Faces, Secret Affair, and Ambulo Zero. Brilliant. It's the jam. Um, so it's all the mod revival stuff from sort of 1978, 79. And then um, I kind of got into that. And through that, my mate. It's a lass who lived at the bottom of our street, and her brother was a scooter boy, so he was into all the sort of Tangle Motown and, and stuff. And we used to listen when he when he'd gone out with his scooter. We used to go into his bedroom and just listen to all his records. Um, and they're probably worth a fortune. Probably not after we finish with them. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it was mad because we all into that sort of stuff. It was it was late seventies, early eighties. Uh, it was early 80s when I went to secondary school, so there was that transitional time of leaving primary school. Mm. Whenever I listen to David Watts by The Jam or The Kinks, I've got it in my head that I'm virtually just not wanting to play football <laughs> at my primary school. It's the, just that I can just see the, the, the playing field now, you know. Um, but it's, uh, it's mad how it, how it sort of brings you back to, to those sort of memories and those times, really. I've not even managed to get my head around this is England yet because that was exactly the time that I, I was growing up and it might trigger me in some way and I'm not sure if it would be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> the clothes were, clothes were exactly the same. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. That, that, that's mad, mad though. Um, you know, talking about the jam and Paul Weller and and um, I'm, you mentioned and you've been thinking about him quite a lot recently. I, uh, 
I don't think there's a day that goes by where I don't listen to at least five to ten jam songs, mate. It's uh, funny enough. I think Setting Suns. It's the it came out this day in 1979, I believe it was, and right. um, that is my favourite jam album. And uh, Burning Sky on that album is flawless. I think that's one that I didn't get. My sister had it. Um, and what was the other one? What was a live album called? Oh, um, oh um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's got the sketches on the on yeah. the. Um, yeah, dig dig the new breed. Dig is the it? new breed. Dig, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when she got that, and that's the first time I'd heard a live album before, and I was like, Amazing, it's the same, same band, <laughs> but it was great, great energy. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, you know, she got me into the small faces, and I remember listening to Art and Stone, and that really, I love that and it kind of got me into sort of playing more acoustic stuff really um and i was through autumn stone i remember listening to uh cross the stills and that and thinking this is pretty similar and then if you listen to like the tim Hardin stuff like red balloon and all that it's kind of it all seems to join together um because it's all a similar sort of style really even though you wouldn't think it if you just mentioned these three bands and just connected them in some way um so i was into all that and then Paul Weller, when he was just doing a lot of radio stuff, I remember when um, it was probably 1995. And I remember him doing a lot of Tim Hardin stuff. Um, so it was like, all oh, right, yeah. And it sort of seems to all the dots connect and everything. And it's, um, so yeah, yeah, it was kind of, and then I got into John Martin and Nick Drake and things like that. And um, Van Morrison, the sort of like Astral Week side of Van Morrison, you know, mm. not the brown eyed girl sort of stuff, but the other stuff earlier stuff and it, it, it was a uh, just real eye opener and when I started playing guitar that's kind of what I wanted to sound like and also I got into Jeff Buckley and then someone said oh you should listen to his dad and someone put on uh, Happy Sad by Tim Tim Buckley and I was absolutely blown away I thought that's the kind of lineup I want double bass and you know kind of mad jazz drums and it's just been all over the place um, so yeah I uh, might be working on a project with um, a few other people, uh, so that will be coming out hopefully in maybe a, a year or two when I've finished knocking the bottom out of this album. <laughs> Brilliant, <laughs> man. Brilliant. Yeah. It's mad to thinking about it, actually, because I don't really think about, you know, how did I get into music? It's sort of, it's odd, really. Mm. Um, I fell into it. I, I don't I think if, I, if my dad had made me have, have like piano lessons or guitar lessons when I was like eight or nine I'd have probably gone off it um, I think I did it because I really wanted to do it um, in spite of everybody <laughs> I think that's it as well though isn't it like if you do something that you want to do and no one's pushing you around you like I'm, my dad always wanted me to do boxing and don't get me wrong I did like it and then it went for a phase where I just didn't think it was for me for some reason. Um, I just didn't like getting punched in the face. Do you know what I mean? No, I didn't like getting punched. I did boxing and I didn't like getting punched in the face and I didn't like punching people. <laughs> exactly. Um, it was like, what am I doing? Uh, and I, I did it from probably the age of about 12 to 15, I think. And by the time I was 15, you know, I was still quite sort of skinny and all the other lads had just filled out and become these massive meatheads, you know, and it was like like being hit by a bus. No. And, I, I, and they really loved hitting people as well, so it was like, it continued out of the ring as well. So it was like, this is a much fun, so I'm not going to do this anymore. No. It's all it's... about the boxing thing. You've got to either want to brutalise people or not. Have you seen the George Foreman um, biopic? No, my dad... Oh. That was that recently. It's recent. was, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah, my dad saw it and uh, he came out and called me. He was like, "You've got to get on this. This is unbelievable." A, but uh, sorry, because he basically, he, apparently, the story goes that he died. You know, uh, he got knocked out and he died during the the um, uh, Muhammad Ali match, and then he basically had this epiphany and he was like, "I don't want to do this anymore. I can't. I'm so full of hate. I just don't want to be." that full of hate i just want to he became a preacher and then started sort of training the young kids up doing boxing then he got into financial trouble because he got ripped off by his agent 
on his, his account. And that's when he started doing the George Foreman <laughs> grills. <laughs> I think everyone, everyone had one of them in the gaff, like at one it's point. It's an amazing film because he went back to fight um, when he was, I think he might have been 40 odd. And um, when he was, we needed to do it to save the community centre that he'd set up this boxing club for, for the youths around his area. And then um, he had this mad fight with, it was like a world championship and he became champion of the world again and got a massive fat paycheck and then didn't have to ever fight again. So he kind of got what he wanted in the end. That's mad, didn't it? Yeah. That's mad. Sometimes it's just written in the stars, isn't it? Yeah, you've got to be a certain type of person to be a certain type of person, I suppose. But yeah. Of course you have, man. Of course you have. So we've mentioned briefly, uh, we've mentioned a little bit here and there about the seals, but uh, I think, you know, let's talk a bit more about them. How did it all start out, mate? Um, well, I was busking. I knew that I was having a really good two weeks because I was working at a venue called Fibbers. Um, and... I just started to sort of play doing venues acoustically. I I used to bust just to get a bit of spare change and stuff like that. But Tim, the, the owner said, you'll never guess who's coming to play here. And I was like, who? And he said, oh, it's John Martin. You like John Martin, don't you? And I was like, I do, but I'm not good enough to support him. Um, and when it came up to the gig, I ended up chickening out and I gave it to my mate, Dave, Dave Keegan, oh. gave the gig to him. Because I, I just thought he was more, so much more suited for that. Um, and I think I was, <laughs> I was just scared of doing it. And Tim was like, well, that's very noble of you. Okay, I get it. And I think my reward was then when I was busking, decided to busk outside of Woolworths, which no one ever does. And, um, uh, I'd had 20 quid in my back pocket, but... Um, I needed to get some change for the bus driver because he was an arsehole and he, he wouldn't ever break at all. <laughs> so I thought, I've got my guitar. I'm just going to stand outside of Woolies and busk for like two minutes just to see if I can get 50p to get to go see my mum and dad. And um, I ended up, this guy walked past with his family and he was called Dennis. And he uh, he basically said, oh, oh my mate's um, looking for a singer and you look like you've got the right haircut and that. So have you got a tape? And I was like, yeah, all right then. So uh, um, I went and get, gave him a tape. And it turned out it was John uh, Squire, so he was looking. And Dennis was the best mate of Martin, who's John's guitar tech. Um, but I already knew that Stu Fletcher joined John Squire, so it didn't take much. When he started to tell me that he was this bloke from a big band and everything, and I was like, oh, is it John Squire? He was like, how the fuck do you know that? And I was like, well, York's a small town, and I know Stu, and I know he's joined his band, so. Um, but the first time I went and did the gig, I did an audition and he came to New York and I got really pissed. Uh, again, nerves. I was on drinking Nuki Brown at the time as well, so like six Fuck. bottles of Nuki Brown. And That'd do it. A load of uh, rum chasers. I used to drink rum, I must have could stunk. And um, I ended up playing these songs and I remember doing No Expectations by the Rolling Stones and I broke four strings on my guitar, so it was like two left. And I, I, I knew I'd totally balls it up but it didn't stop me from drinking more and going up to John every five minutes and annoying him and saying what did you think what do you think you best mate and then he was like fuck off <laughs> and then he came to the gig I had two weeks afterwards which was um, quite insane because I thought he was there to see someone else so I wasn't bothered so I just played my set and then he came over and went that was great um, do you want to do a gig in Manchester? So I did. I did a gig at the Roadhouse. And then after the Roadhouse, he asked me if I wanted to join a band. And then I said, yeah. And then that was that. Um, and the rest of it was mental. It was just a very, very strict, sorry, steep learning, steep learning curve. But also, John was pretty strict on things and quite disciplined, like quite the disciplinarian, really, where he, he'd written a lot of songs that had a lot of chords in, you know, and I was quite happy with just playing like three chords in the truth. And um, so I had to learn very quickly, otherwise I'd have probably been booted out. But it was just <laughs> fun, but it's quite daunting at the same time, you know. I can imagine, but it, it, it must have been, it must have been surreal though to be on stage with, you know, a legend of the game like that. Like, I mean, you're a legend yourself well, in your own way, Chris. Really do any, we, 
I'm, no, I'm not at all. I think you've got to be dead to be a legend, don't you? <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> King Arthur. It. But then there was um, because we didn't really do any gigs with John, and when we were in a little bubble because we just spent a lot of time in the Lake District rehearsing, like rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and writing and writing and writing and practicing and practicing and practicing. Um, and the only times when we go to Leeds to go shopping where you'd realise that everyone knew who John was and he'd get mithered every two steps. And we were on me and Stu were just like going, oh God, that'll never happen. It would, it would be all right. Um, and it, it did. It did happen and it was weird. But I felt for John though because he, you know, he literally wouldn't be able to, at that point, on, he, he couldn't go out for get a, to get a pint of milk, you know, without someone kind of asking him, a billion questions about why the Stone Road is out together mm. and all this. Mm. And there's a lot of people who ask you stuff. They all, they all seem to be experts on you, you know. Um, and no matter how much you tell them, the, otherwise it's like, no, 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 because it says on Wikipedia. And you're like, fucking hell. Oh, I, yeah. I am me. I know who I am. <laughs> but it's interesting. But, you know, you, you got to put up with that. And then there's obviously people, most of the people are really lovely and, and it makes it all worthwhile. So. Brilliant, man. Now, obviously, the, the song that I love, and I'm sure, I mean, there's, that, that album has got some absolute timeless classics. But the one that stands out for me, what do you reckon it is? For you? Standing on your head. No, nah, no. Nah. I've tried that once actually, but my head goes too red. <laughs> no, it was blinded by the sun. Oh, oh really? I thought you were oh, right. going to say that. It's, no, it's... I wouldn't have said that. That's what Love a horrible it. egomaniac would have said. <laughs> well, it's obviously the song I wrote. No, uh, I, I like Standing on Your Head. Um, yeah, I really like that song actually. It's, uh, I mean, I like all of them. I wasn't sure if I did like all of them, but recently when I've been playing them, I've really got into them um, a, lot, a lot more. I think I was really just so terrified about balls in it up when I was in the seances that um, it kind of took the fun out of it a little bit. Whereas doing it now in front of, you know, this acoustic and I get to chill out, I feel like I'm in my own house doing it. I'll just have a real ball and, you know, it's a lot more fun. But also, the, the songs are a lot easier to play, which means I must have learned something over the last 25 years. Which is good too. So yeah. You mentioned at the beginning that you actually wrote that song in Brighton. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I lived in a place called the Dolphin Guest House, where it was the top floor, and it looked out. It was at Lower Lower Rock Gardens in in Brighton, and you you looked out, and it just looked out over the pier. Um, I and think uh, I know where that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it was it was great. So I mean, it was a dingy little you know there were junkies living downstairs that were kind of stealing your dull check and stuff and um it was really mental it was pretty rough going actually um but i wrote a lot of songs when i was there i wrote about maybe 10 songs um blinded yeah. by the sun was one of them um and i remember when i played it to john and he was and steve ads was there as well and i remember steve coming in going like is this a cover? And I was like, no, no. Um, it's just a bunch of songs that I've got, and it's one of them. And he was like, right. And then I don't know, things in the, the, atmosphere, the atmosphere changed somewhat after that, I think. And it was, uh, I was allowed to write more songs. <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote I Want You To Know as well, and I wrote Hello, and then pretty much all the B-sides, really, apart from the full band ones, because... Yeah, I think John kind of did his experimentation stuff with the full band, and I was just doing a little acoustic thing, which I was more than happy to do. To be fair. Is there a gig that stands out for you with the Seals's that you sort of relive from time to time? Um, yeah, there's a good ones and there's the bad ones. So, which I guess the bad one. So, so yeah, yeah, well. There's lots of good ones. There's a few really bad ones that, that and that was just due to the sound being absolutely dreadful. Um, and it was Glastonbury, where it took me 17 and a half years to actually 
get the, you know to, to be I don't know <laughs> confident enough to watch it again because my memory of it was awful I just couldn't hear anything from start to finish it was like white noise just coming through my monitors and then when I asked them to saw it out it would just be more white noise so I was doing it all from muscle memory um, so I thought it was like atrocious like the worst gig in the world literally a living nightmare and then I listened to it years later 17 years later and and it wasn't that bad it was all right i was amazed that i was sort of in tune ish it was okay uh and i wanted it to be so perfect and it was just very far from being perfect and it it really pissed me off um that that it could be so shit so um i kind of got a bit of it with this i became a bit of a stickler about sound after that and um was very annoyed that everything had to be so loud which isn't very rock and roll but at the same time if you can't hear what you're doing it's not going to be that great for the audience you know no no of course um so it's um yeah that was one, one thing that I'd, i realized what that what i wanted but it was very difficult to get it uh, in the environment that i was in but um that was that was one thing um but it was good because when i watched it i wasn't that fussed it was like oh actually this is really pretty cool I like this isn't, this isn't that bad um and then there's the best ones um, two nights at the Barrowlands in 1990, might have been 97, December 1997, uh, the Barrowlands in Glasgow. Yeah, what a venue, yeah, mate. Well, we just finished touring with Oasis for them, what it seemed like forever. And then we ended up coming over to do our tour for the You Can Talk To Me single. Um, and we ended it all up, and I think it was the 22nd and 23rd, I'm probably wrong, uh, of December, where we played at the Barrowlands, and it, and it was, I've never done a gig there like that. It was just insane. It was absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, that was there. Uh, and then one after that was when I did a gig with Shed 7, like 20 years later. Great lads, great lads. At, yeah, and uh, at the Barrowlands as well, and I was just like, this is just nearly as good as the you know the seals is one 20 years ago so it's it's what up there with my well it is my favorite venue there's no denying it do, do you know what chris like honestly I, the musicians i have on here i always ask that question so we had um will from echo and the bunnyman i asked him what what is your favorite venue he said the barrowlands i asked i think it might have been <laughs> chrissy boy from madness i think he said that there's a few others and uh but for me I mean, I, I was very lucky to play there with um, the Brian Jonestown Massacre in February, oh, right? Okay. I've done a few. I did a gig with them in Leeds, actually. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> them. I spent three, three weeks with them on the tour bus. I did the whole UK oh, tour with them. One night. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do two nights, never mind three weeks. But um, yeah, and I was so, and I was sober as well, right? <laughs> Remember that, and it was uh, it was an eye opener. They um, that was yeah, the, oh, Anton is someone who he's he's an absolute genius, and I don't throw that word around lightly. You know, there's very few people who I would say, right, you're a genius. You're Paul Weller, genius. Tommy Cooper, genius. Anton Newcomb in the Brian Jonestown massacre fucking the stuff he's done the albums he's released like i remember we were having a chat one night on the tour bus and he was telling me um he can play something ridiculous like a hundred odd instruments or something and i was like what and he's like mate i could play anything you get it i could play it and then he went and got his his laptop and he said listen to this right this is a new song and i was blown away like literally blown away right and um his homework for me was to listen to every single album that he's he's released <laughs> from the beginning to the end right you managed to do and that. I, a I, lot I, I, mate and i, I managed it took me a long time but i've done it all i mean thank god for spotify these days to have it it's so easy to find i mean it doesn't help the musicians as in other ways but it was easy for me to access because the local record shops in belfast they only had a couple so i managed to get a few of them but um blew me away absolutely blew me away be tempted to watch dig at some point this weekend i think well, no. well do you want to know i never saw dig until two days before i went on the tour and i was like <laughs> fuck 
<laughs> I was <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, do you know what, mate? It was brilliant. I mean, Joel, um, he, he sort of, me and him really bonded really, really well. And uh, he was like Colin as well, Shay, the tech. Like we, it was just like one family. And they liked that I was sort of there to be like the chilled out one, the, like the peace guru, so to speak. And whenever anyone wanted to see a trick, I'd, I'd pull the cards out and start doing stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, surreal. But sorry, not to make it about myself then, Chris. Not but, about it. it's but no, because I know you get, there's always it's some people on there and they go, fuck me, he's talking about himself, isn't he? About me. What do you think about me? <laughs> no, right? <laughs> but I mean, that venue, the Barrowlands, it was like going back in time because I knew the, his, the history and the significance of the venue and how beautiful it was, right? But to step foot in there and um, there was a bloke there and funny enough, his name was, I think it was William and he kept looking at me, looking at me and then when I spoke, he went, oh, I said, well, what's, what's the matter, mate? He said, well, until you spoke, I actually thought you were Liam Gallagher and I thought, fuck <laughs> it, I can't do anything worse. Oh, well, well. oh, oh, cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get that all. The, I'll get that all the time up here, mate. Honestly, like people think you get an haircut like this, you wear a parker. It's Liam Gallagher because apparently he's the only person who wears a parker and has a hair cut like this. But listen, I've been on many rants about that. <laughs> you need to. People need to educate themselves about the whole mod subculture. You know. Yes. But, you're right. I, I, I proper get on my high horse about that and proper go off on one, which I shouldn't do because I'm 33 years old. I'm a dad. I need to chill out a bit. But when people say, oh, he's listened to Wonderwall once, I'm like, right, let me educate you. It, it rattles me. Oh, it says a lot more about them than it does you. Probably <laughs> What's the word you said at knuckle draggers? Oh, come on now. Um, I think, yes, but some people are. I do accept that. But, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. It's um. I always think it think it's funny. I would. I've never been to a gig where everyone had the same haircut as me. Like that would freak me out. It was, you know, especially in the sea horses because I had the worst, dreadfulest mullet ever. It was just awful. No, no. My head grows. I used to look all right when I just stepped out of the salon, and then after about two or three days, it's just started to turn into the proton mullet, and then it was. And you'd be on tour, so you didn't have time to get your haircut. Oh, yeah. And. You, like time I came back, I just looked like the dad from Little House on the Prairie. It was awful. So, yeah, uh, Michael Landon, I think he's called. So, yeah, it's not a good look. So it must freak out Paul Weller and Liam when they look out into the audience and just see these people who look like them. The thing I love about Paul, though, is he changes his hair. Recently, he's done it quite differently. So he's had it really long and he went really short again. Then he did it long. And you see a lot of people who are trying to like keep up with him and that. And I'm like, hey, do your own thing. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I, I've always, there's a, there's a guy in Belfast, um, Sam's Barbers, and he's the only one who like specializes in the mod cut, right? So before he used to do it quite longer. And I was like, do you know what? I want it really short. And at the moment, I think this is it's spot on for me. But he was telling me there was this bloke the other day, right? And he rang him up and he said, um, have you got any slots this week in the morning? And he said, oh, I've got one Friday. He went, all right, I'll fly down. And he was like, what? And then even I was like, what are you on about? The geezer flew in from Manchester, right, to Belfast to get his hair cut and then flew back in the, eve in the afternoon. He's just, wow. he's just flown out to get his hair cut by Sam, right? <laughs> that is, that's mental, that's, isn't it? That's mental illness. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> There's something not right there. But... Uh, well, maybe it's just, you know, a creature of habit. Who knows? That's, that's Mad bad. though, isn't it, man? But, Chris, what, what's, the next, what's the next 12 months hold for you, mate? We know, you know, we've got the sure. album. I'm not sure. I've got a lot on with, this, with the album, and I'm going to be gigging a lot. And I've got to decide on how I'm going to do the set, really, because I can, can't, because there's only me on the stage, so I can swap and change it however I want, depending on what I mm. think. Mm. be more, more fun um, and that doesn't particularly mean pandering to what, what people want um, but I do like to play I like to get a balance of what I want to do and you know and obviously the, the, I'm more happy to play the Seahorses stuff now because I wasn't for 20 odd years and, and I've just mm. done the 25th anniversary and I'm, I'm really enjoying that um, so I'll probably be putting a, a few 
well, a handful of songs from from the um, the new album, but then interspersing it with Seos' stuff and then doing stuff from you know my other solo albums and maybe if I really want to, you know, the odd choice cover here and there. So, um, oh, a couple of covers, eh? Well, it's nice, kind of, it's nice to do it. You learn a lot from playing other people's songs. Um, and then you also realise where you're at as a musician, you know, and if you have, ever, have you learned anything over the last 20 years? Because something that when I was living in Brighton, I wouldn't have ever attempted to play. So, mm. or like um, anything by, by John Martin or anything by the faces even, you know, so. Um, but I do tend to sort of sometimes play the faces a lot. I like playing Ooh La La. Oh, great tune, great tune. Um, but there's more out there that I probably need to pull my finger out and start playing them and learning them. <laughs> Brilliant, man. Well, listen, I've really enjoyed speaking to you as I did when I first met you in um, Northwich, I think it was. It was, it was yeah. lovely to meet you for the first time. And um, again, thank you for joining me tonight, mate. And you too. Thanks again for your time. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm gigging again next week. Album's going to be out uh, March. I'll, I'll say March the 1st, but it may change. Um, the masses are going to the pressing plant tomorrow. So, yeah, that's when I find out when it, when it actually is going to be coming. But, yeah. Brilliant. Exciting times, mate. And I can't wait to listen to it, as I know many others are as well. Thanks, mate. So hopefully care. I'll catch up with you soon. But thanks for your time. No mate. bother. See you soon. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. And there we go. That was episode 23 with the fantastic Chris Helm. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you again next week for more Talking to Mod. Oh, <laughs>